Uh, welcome everyone again. Um, thanks for your participation. Um, feel free to work, uh, to reach out any time with any suggestion that can help um, us manage these webinars. Uh, we've had lots of feedback from investors and advisors uh, all around the country. Shout out to that small investor group up in Crescent Head that watch every week. Um, and for financial advisors and brokers, uh, this event is CPD accredited for one hour of learning. So those who watch the whole webinar will, will automatically receive CPD accreditation from the FBA. Uh, for all of those, uh, for all of you online, please feel free to uh, ask questions. There is a green button online uh, that will help you ask those questions. You will remain anonymous the whole time. We've also just re recently re written an article on the top 10 performers of our Share Cafe uh, Hidden Gems webinar. Um, if you invested in $1,000 in every company, you would have made around 22%. If you invested in the top 10, how you select the top 10 is up to you, of course. But if you invested in all those top 10, you probably would have doubled your money. So there's money to be made for investors in watching these webinars and having access to CEOs. That said, there's no financial advice or recommendations implied by these webinars. This is purely educational. We're here to help you better understand a company and their business model. Okay, first up we have Self Wealth, um, ASX code SWF, with a market cap of around 115 million. The company has a uh, one year return of 226%. It is Australia's cheapest online broker, and it'll be really interesting to hear from uh, CEO Rob Edgley, um, given what's happening in trading volumes across the globe and what this has meant for self-wealth in regards to cash flow. Um, so Rob, over to you, and uh, thank you for your time. Uh, welcome everyone. I'm very pleased to be here today. Um, the audience uh, on today's webinar uh, very interested in investing. Um, so we, I won't have to go into too much detail about, uh, about the history of the company or what we do because we're also all about uh, helping people invest um, for the future. Um, Self Wealth was, uh, Self -Wealth was founded uh, in 2012 uh, by Andrew Ward and it was essentially started as a, a peer to peer uh, investor group. Um, that uh, subscription model uh, led to uh, over the, uh, in the next three or four years uh, a, a good number of people joining and they were taking advantage of, of some of the, the data that was available on self wealth uh, which took some um, uh, portfolios SMSF portfolio data that was through a business partner BGL um, who's the largest provider of uh, accounting software for um, compliance purposes. They uh, still to this day provide uh, their SMSF data through to Self Wealth. Self Wealth analyzes that and um, is able to discern the best investors from that very large pool and, and share some of the, the types of stocks that those investors hold. Um, after um, three or four years where the, the peer group uh, grew to a substantial number, the next stage of the business was to launch an online broking business. After we decided that uh, we knew what to buy and we knew our clients knew what they wanted to buy, the, the, the challenge then was to go and buy those stocks and to do it at a reasonable price. And so uh, Andrew Ward, the founder, had a very strong conviction that people should not pay exorbitant brokerage, they should not pay a commission brokerage and they, um, they should not be uh, stuck with a whole bunch of fees as well. So. Um, Self Wealth has a, a very um, famous sort of a catch cry. It's $9.50 flat rate brokerage, no commissions, no bank fees. So set 2017, the company was listed on the exchange and um, has been growing ever since. That growth was uh, considerable pre-COVID. Uh, however, it has no doubt that as with global uh, online broking businesses, there has been a, it's been turbocharged um, and there's been a great acceleration of interest uh, in the market and a lot of new entrants and that's led to a, a lot of um, new clients coming on to self wealth. I just want to spend a couple of minutes um, giving you some reasons why 
um, the growth is, of the company has, is now um, incredibly strong. Um, there are a couple of structural changes, key structural changes that have fueled this growth. Um, global, globally, interest rates have gone from low to ultra low, and that has driven a whole generation of savers um, into uh, transforming into a generation of investors. Whole asset markets, such as the term deposit markets, uh, have essentially disappeared from the, the perspective of being able to grow your wealth. You still can um, maintain your cash balances through a term deposit, uh, but the ability to, to grow your wealth significantly over time uh, with low interest rates has, has disappeared. Um, also, for many years, we've been going through digitization of the investment market. Um, that has been accelerated, particularly with COVID. Uh, we have a, a generation, in particular millennials, and Gen Y, that, that age bracket, sort of 18 through to 35, um, people who are absolutely comfortable online, uh, they run their whole lives online, uh, and for them to open an online broking account to grow their wealth uh, over time is a, is a very simple thing to do. So the digitization of investment markets has been um, really accelerated and caused uh, it's caused a uh, an immense um, increase in the addressable market for our uh, for our services. Um, we have been able to add uh, around twenty five thousand new clients, um, of which in the first six months of the year, of which the first um, uh, sixty percent of those are uh, those clients are actually uh, in that demographic that I was just talking about. So, when once upon a time, going back a couple of years the addressable market for our business, the amount of new people in the market and the amount of people changing from one broker to another was around the 60 to 70,000 per annum. Uh, we believe now in this year, 2020, uh, we have as many as potentially a quarter of a million or more people looking for online, making the decision that they want to either enter the market and open an online broking account or, or actually um, uh, churn from another broker to us. So I'll go on to the next slide and we'll just have a look at some of um, those structural changes are obviously driving uh, the tailwinds. However, self-wealth has a number of advantages uh, distinct to themselves, uh, which is also meaning that more, more of that addressable market, more of those people are finding their way onto the self-wealth platform. Uh, key is our lead leadership on costs. Um, uh, we are the market leader in terms of uh, and no one else is to this day is providing a, a flat fee brokerage. So that is $9.50. You do a $10,000 or $100,000 trade or a million dollar trade. Your brokerage is $9.50. There's no hooks. There's no, uh, no fees. Uh, it's very, very simple. And it's something that has resounded with um, large parts of the community and driven a lot of people to us. We also have a being um, cloud based and relatively new, uh, we have compared to our competitors, we have a very scalable, scalable technology um, that's, that's able to interact with our suppliers very well. Um, so that enables people to join Self Wealth very quickly, um, pass through our, our processes, our onboarding processes, and get started in, in the investment markets. It's also scalable in the sense that um, over the last six months, with a massive increase in volumes and massive increase of, of users of our system, um, we still haven't had any outages, touch wood, uh, and we've been performed um, much better than, than all of our uh, competitors, in particular some of the very large competitors with legacy systems that, um, that, that have uh, outages on a, on, a, on a somewhat regular basis. Um, we also have a very strong um, digital marketing presence. Um, once people have decided to join an online broker, they, they really uh, have the option of um, choosing one. And we find that they come to us because of our strong digital presence in the market. I'll go on to the next slide. I'm conscious of only having a bit of short period of time here. You can see there the active traders growth. Um, on the right hand column, the 14,000 uh, new, new clients in the June quarter, uh, 10,500 in the March quarter, and we're now cumulatively sitting just under, under 50,000 clients in total. Next slide. Mm. 
uh, can, uh, you can see the effect of COVID in accelerating our growth. Uh, every month since January, we've actually increased the amount of trades. Uh, the, the recent record in June was uh, 134,000 trades, and that's off a base of 33,000 trades um, in January this year. I'll move on to the next slide, thanks. That uh, with, um, with those trades, people opening their accounts at Self Wealth, that brings cash onto our system and the client cash balances have, have also um, improved significantly uh, to the point where the last two quarters we've been, at the end of the last two quarters, we've been sitting at around $360 million uh, of cash on our system. It's one of the, uh, the areas that we uh, receive compensation for. Uh, and it just shows you that people are treating their trading accounts now simply as a bank account. You need the money in your account to be able to take, uh, take the opportunities that the market presents. And therefore, um, we're not seeing people move their account, their money in and out of their accounts as much as we were. Um, it's, it, cash balances stay there, ready, waiting for the next opportunity. Uh, next slide, please. Um, increase in clients, increase in trades, increase, increase in money on our system, and a general increase in the, in the interest in the market overall has led to um, uh, the company being, providing its first uh, positive operating cash flow in the June quarter. And you can see on the right-hand side, uh, the revenue has uh, increased substantially. The last quarter was around 4.2 million uh, after the, the March quarter being around 2 million. So we're, um, we're growing strongly and we're continuing to look at, at diversifying our revenues. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, last slide here, um, in order to diversify our revenues and in order to uh, deliver what our clients want, um, we have a number of things in the pipeline. First of all, our, we will begin US equity trading in the at the end of uh, towards the end of this year. Uh, secondly, we will have a, a new mobile app up and running uh, early in the fourth quarter in October, and uh, we'll continue to add uh, many many new trading features that our clients regularly are reaching out to us to uh, ask for. I'll finish there, Tim, and uh, let you feed me some questions. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Um, and we've got a couple of questions. Um, like obviously, in the States, really? the trend is towards uh, zero brokerage. Do, do you think that's going to come to Australia? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, obviously, in the US, uh, many uh, brokers are at zero already. Um, it's a very different structure, that market. The Australian market has a, a couple of things that the US doesn't. Uh, in the US, um, online brokers feed uh, their volume of business through market makers and hedge funds, people who pay them a rebate to receive that volume flow. Um, that doesn't happen in Australia. No one, no one, uh, there's no market makers who will rebate brokers. Therefore, that form of revenue is uh, available in the US. It's not available in Australia. Secondly, the, the ASX structure of the ASX is such that um, uh, online brokers are charged uh, through their clearing um, fees that are the variable fees that relate to the volume of the transaction. So it's a variable rate in the US, that's a fixed rate. So the more business you do in Australia, the more money you end up paying to the ASX. And therefore, um, to, to run at zero brokerage and do a lot of business, you are going to be up to considerably more uh, cost than you are in the US. So it's, it's absolutely possible. Uh, a company such as Robin Hood, $8 billion company, they could decide to loss lead in Australia to, uh, to attempt to grow a client base to sell other financial products, but the, the entry, to enter the market, they will have to loss lead for a considerable period of time. Right, thank you. Um, and if you, you've got some questions here around specific um, features that you plan to add. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Yes, um, obviously the international trading is a, is a, a, a big feature, um, a, a really a new market in itself. Um, but with regard to the core platform, uh, we have um, a, a subscription model where people are able to pay $20 a month. Um, for that month, they receive that community data that I mentioned right at the beginning of the presentation. Um, that's very useful. Um, we, at, at the moment, only a small group of, um, of our 
clients are taking up that opportunity. So what we'll be doing is adding to that to, um, to give people more things they want, such as uh, research, uh, in-depth five to 10 page research reports on every stock in the ASX, on every stock in the US market, um, things like in, um, environmental stock ratings, um, live pricing. Live pricing is, um, is uh, on, our, on our site. Uh, when you go to transact, you have live pricing. However, watch lists at the moment uh, are on a 20 minute delay. Uh, live pricing is something that we're, we will be bringing in. We're just work, working through the process of how much we're going to charge for that because the ASX obviously charges for uh, quite, quite a, a decent amount for that, for that additional service. And uh, there's, there's lots of questions here about um, international trading. So I think you mentioned just the States. Is there a plan to go further into Europe and Asia markets? Yes, when we've set up the uh, international business, uh, which we're in the process of doing at the moment, um, we've uh, signed a long-term contract with Refinitiv, a, a global data provider, to get all the business that all the data that we need to operate our US business. And we have an option to with them to uh, to add an additional two markets to that at the moment. So we'll see how that goes. Um, we'll see. We'll be guided by our clients. Um, uh, if there's interest in an Asian market, but in, for example, or a, the U a European market, um, we'll be in a position to do that. Um, we'll be in a position to have that data um, at, at, very, at very little extra expense to us. So it, it's easily turned on. Great, thank you. And then uh, there's a question about uh, shareholders' deposits on account. How, how secure are they? Yeah, um, they're very secure. Um, the account, uh, the accounts are held at ANZ. Uh, they're in the um, the investors' names. Uh, the stock is in their HIN, uh, and uh, Self Wealth cannot uh, cannot uh, access those funds or use those funds other than uh, with the uh, under the instructions of the uh, of the clients of uh, who owns the account. So that's fine. And, and as per being an ANZ account. Um, they are subject to the same uh, government guarantees up to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So um, it's it's very much uh, the same as having a, a normal bank account. Great, thanks, uh, Rob. Um, that's all we have time for at the moment. We've got a, quite a few additional questions that we might uh, relay those to you directly. Okay, thanks Great. very much. Thanks, thanks for your time, okay. Rob. Uh, next up, we have NanoView, ASX code NVU. Uh, it's got a market cap of around $10 million. Uh, we have with us the CEO, Alfred Chong. Uh, the share price has risen over 45% over the last 12 months. What does the company do? It changes the way people engage with their smartphones and tablets through highly immersive and ultra-functional uh, mobile screen protector technology. That's a mouthful. Um, just recently, they've announced uh, the first sales of its antiviral protection products to Singapore, an important product in this COVID environment. Um, thank you for your time, Alfred. Over to you. Thank you. Um, next slide, please. So, inherently, Nanoview is a company that I started in uh, 2012. Um, we're grounded on nanotechnology, on deep science, and the journey has taken us through uh, several iterations of products. The latest rendition is the one that's drawing the most attention. Uh, essentially, that, that project was worked on uh, mid last year in the absence of even knowing that there was a pandemic uh, uh, that would st still, that would eventually come about. Um, so that has been a fortuitous decision because it has allowed us to, to get the science and, and get uh, the technology already uh, which uh, became fairly evident uh, in the first of the year. Um, next slide, please. So the technology is principally grounded from, uh, from ASTAR. ASTAR is a, the largest research institute in Singapore. There are about 4,500 scientists um, at ASTAR, and we continue to work with them uh, to come up with various products, uh, typically all grounded with very, very uh, high barriers of entry with, that are typically patented uh, so that the defensibility is, 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 is extremely important uh, and hard to break. Um, next slide, please. 
So we're all living in this new normal. Um, it's, it's something that, you know, the, the, our AGM, which is coming out at the end of the month, is actually done through Zoom. So that's the testament for uh, things that have evolved. Um, and our first uh, product that we will be introducing uh, within the next few weeks is actually based on, on a screen protector, primarily because uh, we felt that other than, uh, other than a lot of other things that you touch, um, the mobile phone is the one that's most often touched. And it's something which uh, has uh, enough germs that would be tantamount to, to the toilet seat. And that, that essentially gave us our first inkling as to which of the different products with the signs that we have developed uh, to enter into and, 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 and both the, uh, the screen protector as well as the case was, was what we uh, had initially um, developed and, and will be shipping uh, by the end of uh, this month. Applications going forward with the new normal uh, and now with um, being on lockdown in Singapore and coming uh, off uh, in, in the next, uh, in, in stage two, and then eventually going to stage three is, is the world that we all um, essentially are, are as unprecedented. Um, so being able to, to not fly, being able to, uh, to, to not touch as much as, as we'd like to, washing our hands is the new normal. And, and if you look at the ways uh, some countries have even opened up, um, you know, the, the, the uh, second and third wave is, is, is somewhat um, um, predicted and therefore defensibility is, is actually the only solution. It's, it's, it's not about, you know, locking people up. It's, it's, it's all about uh, developing tools and developing products that, uh, that would allow us to defend ourselves. And, and we feel we have such a product. Next slide, please. So currently this slide is the one that I, uh, that I keep changing. I mean, when I first, first brought this slide up, it was uh, the 10 million documented cases. Uh, it's now up to 13. We anticipate that to grow, um, you know, as, as more countries report, as more tests, testings are, are, are being done. So we feel that um, this problem that has been, has been uh, further exacerbated by the fact that, you know, we, people don't wear masks in different types of, of countries and therefore uh, being able to, uh, to have a product such as this is becoming, has become more and more relevant. Uh, next slide, please. So NanoShield was a, was a product that we have, uh, we have launched. Uh, we have done testing in, in Japan, Singapore, and the US. Uh, we've registered as a class one uh, medical device in, in Australia, and it has TGA approval. Um, it's, it's, it's a product which has very good transmission uh, capabilities. So, you can almost see through it. There's about 90% uh, of visible light that can go through it with about 6% of, of a haze. It is fairly, fairly uh, uh, hard. Um, and we're expanding this to, to other products, which I'll talk about next. Um, next slide, please. So these are some of the products we're coming out with. Uh, in the first instance, there's the screen protector, there's the, the rear cover, uh, there's tape. Uh, there are there are things that such as this, which is a piece of plastic that goes over your door handles because it's probably touched the most. Cylindrical door handles, a placemat, so you'll be able to put it onto the areas that you would eat, as well as a face shield. So these are all the different types of products from a B to C perspective that we're launching at the end of this month primarily so that you'll be able to, um, to not have uh, touch points be a vulnerable point in your day-to-day -day, uh, living. Next slide, please. It's all about validation, right? Um, antimicrobial has been around for probably about a decade or so, and, and many, many companies have, have touted to have antimicrobial uh, capabilities, but that, that, is, that does not mean it has antiviral, um, being able to, to find the right substance, being able to ensure that this substance has, has the validation and the, 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 the lab test to validate that has been the cornerstone of, of what we have done. 
Um, so we, we've tested the, the, the product aggressively uh, against the traditional bacteria and viruses. Uh, in E. coli, it, it can actually bring down a uh, count of 1 million to over just about 12, uh, 1,200 in slightly over uh, four to five minutes. Um, in influenza, it's, it's, uh, it's again a million parts to less than detection point in about three minutes. So different kinds of viruses and bacteria have different um, response time. Uh, we've tested the human coronavirus strain, the OC43, and was able to bring it down into four logs in less than 30 minutes. Uh, in the mouse corona strain, we were able to bring it down to one log, which is about 90% in less than 10 minutes. So the, these kinds of uh, validation is, is, is important because it's, you know, we can, a lot of companies can make the claim, but without having the right data, without or having the right uh, efficacy report to support that is, 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 uh, is, is, is something that uh, is, is present in our technology. Next slide, please. So a lot of people have asked, and how does it all work, right? Is this a pimp, simple piece of plastic or a piece of glass? Um, and, and, you know, it, 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 does, um, it does have some science involved in it, which I'll explain next. Uh, viruses are typically non-enveloped or enveloped. They have a, a, a very similar structure. Um, and it's either a positive or a negative strand. Um, and the, uh, the RNA or the lipid structure that is inside of it is, is the thing that causes the damage. The virus uh, is actually, all it, all it is is that it, it, it takes the time to exist until it finds a host. And it has been known to sit on plastics, to sit on table tops, and sit on on a, on a phone for for days and hours. So it it it, it rests there and, and looking for a host. Next slide, please. So what we have done is that we have taken uh, the form of um, copper, which uh, exists in 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 you know substances that have been around for 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 in terms of pipes in terms of cookware. And we've been able to harvest uh, the copper into nanoparticles. Uh, imagine one, one nanometer is one millionth of one millimeter. So we're working on very, very small nanoparticles. Uh, the version of, of the particle that we'll, of copper that we're working on is, is cuprous iron. Um, and normal copper can actually have um, a reduction of about two hours and the, and the fact that we've, we've actually worked on this is, is important because it differentiates ourselves from, from someone like Corning that's using Cupric, uh, which has a, a, a longer efficacy than, than what we have. Next slide, please. So there, there are several ways. I don't want to get uh, too technical here um, in, in, in the way it actually works. Um, simply what it does is that it will sit on top of the piece of plastic uh, and we've, we've, we've cultivated that um, into a raisin mix that's proprietary. Uh, and as soon as the virus lands onto a, that particular surface, uh, it will it actually create a redox reaction where the, um, uh, the hydroxyl radical uh, works akin to like an antioxidant. So we, we ch the copper changes state from monovalent to bivalent copper. And in doing that, uh, it, it actually has a very, very strong effect on the walls of the virus and therefore rendering it um, uh, ineffective because it breaks the, the, the actual outer wall of the virus. So it goes through three different methods, uh, all of which has a positive effect in being able to uh, eliminate the wall of the virus and therefore make it uh, ineffective in being able to find its host and then being able to work itself uh, once if it even finds its host. So pathway to market, we are already in production. Uh, we will, should be done by the end of the uh, month. Uh, everything is geared up uh, to be uh, launched at the end of, again, at the end of the month through the website called nanoshield.co. Uh, we've already dispatched first sales in July and, and, and have been uh, working with a number of different uh, potential distributors. Reference sites includes, um, you know, 
uh, agreement that we've signed in Thailand, in Singapore, and we're badging it into things like uh, touch screens, we're badging it into uh, fitness equipment, all the things that you touch base with. Next slide. The applications are, are quite uh, bountiful. You're talking about all the way from push doors, handrails, elevators, uh, um, onboard equipment, the things that we sign our UPS equipment on, the bench top, desktops. So there's, there's unlimited applications that we're going into. So these are some of the other products which I'll, slip, uh, I'll, I'll uh, skip in the interest of time, but a vending machine and, and a vision correction as well as the anti-reflective products, all of which we should be able to be uh, introducing by, um, by next year. So maybe if I run out of time, I'll, I'll, I'll skip through all of this. This is a little bit about the company which Tim had covered. Um, and we feel this is an opportunity because we're at the, at the start of our journey and, and we will, you know, at least with this particular product have, have, uh, have a, a reasonable a future going forward. So Tim, I'll over to you. Thanks, Alfred. Um, now, the company listed a, a couple of years ago. Was was the plan always to go down this kind of uh, COVID path, if you like, to ad to address those sort of issues? So, underpinning to all of this is deep technology. Uh, initially, when we went public, it was on a, the three D product with uh, the product which I just uh, showed you just now, which is the press bi biopia product. So, essentially, what it does is that. Um, you have a screen and you have algorithm uh, that would essentially uh, not require you to wear glasses. So that project is still in development. We're looking at a launch of, of, of next year. Uh, in the meantime, because of the affiliation with, with ASTAR and some of the uh, institutions in Singapore, uh, the opportunity for the COVID part, the antiviral came about uh, last year and we, we we uh, pushed it to full scale by the, at the first of this year, which is why we have uh, a product right now at mid year. Mid -year. And and uh, there's there's lots of questions here about the sales channel, whether it's going direct to consumer or you know business to business. How how do you manage? I mean, it has multiple applications. How do you, how do you manage that sales channel? Uh, typically, we have two kinds: B two C and B two B. Right, B two B would be the ones that would effectively take care of all the applications which I lined out previously. So we'd find a company uh, that's, that's good in schools or in government, and we, we, we essentially arm them with our film, which comes in a one meter length. And then that film is cut to shape and form into the touch points that they, they would uh, come across. So if you find uh, one of the customers that we've signed up is based in the US and they are uh, very focused in, in touch screen. So digital touchscreen. So we, we give them the roll and they would cut it to size and then it fix it into the touchscreen so you'll be able to touch onto it. The B2C still, still, still uh, continues and it's, it's uh, the screen protectors including all the, uh, all the doorknobs that we had and that would be marketed through uh, our website as well as through Amazon and, and some of the digital uh, sites extending into uh, some of the traditional retail channels. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for your time, um, Alfred. A, a very timely story, and um, and good luck with your distribution Thank there. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Next, next up, we have Open Learning. Um, open Learning ASX Code O double L with a market cap of thirty two million. Open Learning is one of the world's largest online education platforms with a prominent position. In, in the $46 billion education market that is Southeast Asia. Uh, we have with us the founder and uh, CEO, Adam Brimmer. Adam is a passionate uh, tech entrepreneur. I met Adam some time ago when he first established his company back in uh, 2012. Thanks for your time, Adam. Good to see you again and over to you. Good to see you, Tim. Thanks for having me today as well. Um, so just to get started, uh, we'll go to the next slide. Thanks. So Open Learning is one of the largest online education platforms in the world. And what we do is we provide the technology, um, the platform to enable education providers to move online very quickly. Um, but not just fast, but also at a very high standard in terms of educational quality. So the business was founded in 2012 
Um, uh, initially by my, uh, myself and two co-founders, a professor from the University of New South Wales uh, and one of my uh, colleagues from the University of New South Wales who was doing a PhD in online learning communities. Uh, we expanded to Southeast Asia in 2015. Uh, initially we ran as a free platform and the goal was really to build up our user base um, and to demonstrate value. Um, because in the market uh, that we're in, you it takes some time to actually build credibility with institutions and they need to see that you can operate at scale and, and deliver for them. So open learning uh, in a similar way to Coursera and FutureLearn and edX um, pursued a free model initially. And now we're monetizing via software as a service and actually promoting and, and selling a whole range of courses from our university and institution partners. Um, and we're benefiting significantly from a global shift to education, online education. Now this is a shift that's been happening for some time, uh, but it's been accelerated substantially uh, due to COVID-19. So where we are today is we have about 2.2 million learners on the platform. This is at the end of the first quarter uh, of, this, of, um, of this year, uh, end of March uh, for us. We have 76 uh, B2B SaaS customers. This includes nine of the 43 Australian universities, but also a whole range of um, uh, corporates, professional associations, uh, government agencies, both here and in um, Southeast Asia, particularly in the Malaysian market. Uh, since we've moved to a software as a service model, um, our ARR has grown over 80% year on year to over a million dollars at the end of the first quarter. Um, but we also generate revenue through our learning services division, which helps people redesign their courses and our marketplace um, where people can promote their courses through the platform. So really what you have on open learning is the end to end solution for the delivering a course online, everything from promoting your course, uh, collecting payment, enrolling students, uh, delivering the course and on open learning delivery is all about having a really engaging uh, collaborative project based learning approach where people actually uh, learn something by doing rather than by watching a video and doing a quiz. Um, you know, no one learned to play tennis by watching Wimbledon. You actually have to get on the court and you've got to actually practice. Uh, and that's what Open Learning enables people to do online. You can actually practically learn things and do things uh, in groups of people. Um, at the end of the course, you can have an assessment process, uh, issue certificates and badges. Um, and every learner who leaves Open Learning has a portfolio of learning. So they can actually demonstrate that knowledge uh, to their employer or to their institution um, where they've come from. Uh, we'll go to the next slide, please. So we're backed up um, since we listed in, in December uh, 2019. Uh, we've been backed up by a fantastic board of directors. Uh, includes Kevin Berry, who's the chairman of ICS, uh, David Buckingham, uh, the former CEO of Navitas, uh, Spiro, the chairman of Split It, uh, Maya, who's the VP of Twitter in Asia Pacific, uh, and Beverly, uh, who's the, uh, who was previously the deputy vice chancellor of education at Deakin University, uh, and a leader in the, in the field of micro-credentials. Um, so we've got uh, a great range of experience, both across the higher education sector, um, both public and private, uh, across uh, the finance sector, um, and across ASX listed companies as well, and across Southeast Asia uh, with Maya's background. Uh, next slide. So the big problem that we're addressing, and you know, this is a problem that existed seven years ago when I started the company, and it's more important now than ever. Um, and that's that access to quality online education is limited. Um, now, that may seem strange because there's a lot of online courses out there and a lot of things claiming to be online courses. But when you dig into it, most of those are really um, very short, um, you know, sort of uh, content heavy courses. You know, they have a video, they have a quiz, um, you know, maybe they have a, you know, a test at the end or something. But you're not really learning very in-depth skills and those aren't replacing, um, you know, your university or your college. Um, now, that's the challenge that most people face. You know, you, you've got, got this big gap. You've got things which, you know, you can learn from if you're really interested, if you're like an autodidact or something. Um, but, you know, if you actually want to go through and learn a new skill, a lot of people still end up going to university, college, TAFE, um, wherever that might be. And now people have to reskill and retrain to stay employable. So in Malaysia, one of our uh, key markets, 70% uh, of semi-skilled workers are at high risk of, of losing their job due to automation. Uh, in Australia, 74% of Australian workers are ready to completely retrain to remain employable. And this was before COVID-19. So we can only imagine that um, everyone now has to retrain. Um, and globally, uh, it was previously expected about half the economy um, or half the workers in the economy would be impacted by automation. So these are substantial problems. Um, and you know, the way they're gonna be solved is by the education system itself, particularly the higher education system, uh, stepping up and delivering better quality online courses that are aligned to the needs of, of uh, society and industry. Next slide. So what we do 
um, is we've got this complete ecosystem where we've got a scalable cloud platform. So education providers that, you know, in a turnkey way can have an online education business up and running. Prior to open learning and, and currently a lot of, um, you know, big universities and colleges, what they do is they're cobbling together a whole range of systems to achieve this goal. They might have a student management system, uh, an enrollment system, a learning management system, then they talk to a payment gateway. And by the time they've spent two years trying to integrate everything, they don't have any money left to actually build a good course. Um, and open learning provides all of that technology, all of those tools um, ready to go uh, on a software as a service model. And institutions can then put their effort into designing better quality content um, for those learners. Um, now, when you have great content, students learn something. And that, those learn, that evidence of learning goes into their portfolio. And at the same time, we have a built-in system for micro-credentials. Now, this, what this means is that people who go through the course don't just get a certificate or a badge, they actually are able to demonstrate their knowledge. And our assessment system is very unique and that enables um, outcome-based assessment for authentic education. What that really means is that, you know, if you wanna learn a new skill, um, we can show that person what that person did to learn that skill, uh, and that's used in the assessment process. Uh, we also have our uh, website, which acts like a marketplace for online education. So you can go there and you can see, you know, top quality courses from Open Learning uh, and our partners. Uh, next slide, please. So um, Open Learning has grown significantly over the years. Um, as I mentioned before, we've got about 2.2 million uh, users on the platform, over 50 million peer-to-peer -peer interactions. I've issued about 1.4 million micro-credentials uh, globally. Uh, next slide. So uh, as Tim mentioned, we're operating in uh, multi-billion dollar markets. Now, the great thing about the higher education sector is, um, you know, even in small countries uh, like Australia, Malaysia, and, and, and many countries in Southeast Asia, even though these are small countries population-wise, the higher education sector is very large uh, and, very, and, and a very significant part of the economy. And we've been able to secure blue chip clients across all parts of the higher education sector in our two key markets, Australia and Malaysia. So in Australia, we work with the likes of UNSW, Western Sydney University, Australian Catholic University, who are actually a strategic investor uh, in open learning. They invested in our IPO last year. Um, we recently signed with Open Universities Australia, the largest online higher education marketplace in the country, um, to implement micro-credentials. So open learning will be their platform. Uh, from micro-credentials and they're going out to their 21 university partners as we speak. Um, beyond that, in the vocational sector, um, we've worked across a whole range of providers. Um, some of these are in Singapore here, Tomasic Polytechnic, uh, I got in Malaysia, the Penang Skills Development Corporation, um, but we also work across industry associations and professional development. Um, everything from uh, teacher training um, all the way through um, to uh, nursing and, and uh, cybersecurity and a whole range of different programs. But what this is showing is that there's a substantial market here. These education providers are delivering their core business face-to-face. -face, and previously, online was seen as a nice, you know, a nice to have, an extra on top. Um, but now online is becoming the way they deliver their core business and the way they reach new markets. And we're there to support them and enable them to do that. Um, next slide. So where we sit is that uh, globally, there's a, only a handful of large, online education platforms that are sort of in this end-to-end -end cloud platform space where they combine the elements of both a platform, a marketplace, you know, learning design. Um, and in the US, we've got Coursera and Udacity and edX. Um, in the UK, there's FutureLearn. In Australia and Southeast Asia, there's Open Learning. Now, we all started around the same time. When we first started, there were a lot more competitors out there. Um, but as this market has been very difficult for everyone to get traction in and very difficult to build a sustainable business in, all of us have outlasted the rest, um, so to speak. So whereas there were previously competing platforms in Australia, uh, now there aren't any. Uh, in Southeast Asia, when we first entered Malaysia in 2015, there were a couple local, local competitors. They're all gone now. Um, and as we're starting to expand across Southeast Asia, we're seeing that early efforts to create these kinds of very large scale learning platforms, um, you know, while people had tried to invest and build them initially, they haven't been as successful. And now we've got the track record to show that we can deliver with that. Uh, next slide. Now, we've grown very, very significantly organically. Um, you know, prior to this year, we were growing very steadily. Um, in fact, even when we switched from a free platform to a software as a service model, uh, the, the enrollment base kept growing. But in the first quarter of this year, we, saw, we added almost half a million enrollments and over 350,000 new students onto the platform. 
Um, and that's been driven by a lot of people moving online for the first time, but also a big shift towards online professional development uh, for working professionals. Um, and we've got over 8,000 courses running on the platform from all of our providers. Next slide. So the way we're growing the business now is by focusing on our, our key differentiators. Um, you know, that includes the learning philosophy. So this approach, it's, it's a really called a, a socially constructive approach to education, focused on learning by doing and providing the platform for that. That's unique. None of those global platforms have that style of learning, implement that style of learning on their platform, which is what all the top institutions are implementing now on campus. And now they want to implement that online. So our, our acquisition strategy is focused on you know, sales and marketing to the large institutions, but then also automating onboarding so small providers can come on board on their own. So as I said, we've got 76 of the large uh, higher education providers on the platform. We actually have over 400 uh, small independent educators paying a few hundred dollars to a thousand dollars a year uh, to use the platform as well. And that's all automated through the site. Um, we've also uh, streamlined our onboarding process and we've also been growing our usage within our existing client base. So, you know, some universities might start off paying $24,000 a year for open learning for a few thousand students. That very quickly grows to 50,000, 100,000 as more students come onto the platform. Next slide. So one of the big areas of growth we're seeing as well is the micro-credential market. Now, micro-credentials is a concept that have been around for quite some time, uh, a few years, but no one really knows what they are. I mean, you know, do you get credit for it? How much is it? You know, is it any good? Why should I pay, you know, $1,000 for that? But, you know, LinkedIn Learning has, is free or there's, you know, $10 course on Udemy. So micro-credentials are actually sitting in between, you know, all the bottom of the barrel, you know, uh, low quality online education and degree programs. Um, micro-credentials uh, in, in the context we're talking about here are anywhere from two and a half hours of really high quality learning all the way up to 150 hours of high quality learning. 150 hours equals one unit in a master's degree. Whereas two and a half hours is more uh, aligned to like a continuing professional development program. So we've launched OpenCreds, which is the, uh, the first cross-sector micro-credential framework in Australia, it covers higher education, vocational and industry uh, associations and enables them to design and deliver courses that are not just quality, but also can be a pathway and credit towards degrees. And the key thing I'll just mention uh, before we go to questions is that the arrangement we have with Open Universities Australia now is wide ranging and really significant. In fact, it's a game changer for the company. And what it means is that the largest online higher education platform in the country for degrees is now moving into micro-credentials and they're doing it with us. So they've got 440,000 alumni who've, who've gone through their programs over the past probably over 20 years now. And they've selected Open Learning as their platform for micro-credentials and open creds is the framework under which those will be developed. So together, we're not just providing the platform, we're actually partnering to build out 30 open creds to seed the market from universities across the country. And those courses will be coming to market um, you know, in the sort of September, October uh, period, the first ones will come to market then. So we're really excited about it. I think um, we're seeing huge traction from existing universities, colleges coming onto the platform. But with these kind of partnerships, there's a lot more to come. I think that's all the slides I've got, Tim. I don't know if there's another one. Oh, okay. Yeah. We, we've got a great management team. Um, you know, Shri Diaz, ex study group, uh, David, uh, co founder who's doing his uh, PhD at UNSW. Um, Sarveen, uh, actually from an investment banking background, but passionate about education, leads the team in Malaysia. And Huat, our CFO, uh, who knows the Southeast Asian market very well, was a former uh, CFO of Parks and Retail. So over to you, Tim. Thanks, Adam. Um, plenty of questions here. Um, the, the government just announced that uh, job trainer skills program in that vocational space. Does that, does that play into your hands? Yeah, it does. Um, now, when you see things like this, you know, we're, we're the platform that will enable uh, many institutions to go to market with quality online learning. Now, the question about that program is, you know, what portion will go to TAFE? So effectively, you know, government to government and which will actually end up with most of the, um, the education providers in the country. We work with a lot of the private um, higher education providers, vocational providers as well. Um, and they're the ones who are gonna be our customers. Uh, we already have a number on board and we're expanding heavily in that sector. Um, we don't yet know all the details of how that funding will be broken down, but anything that creates demand for online education or skills training uh, definitely uh, plays into, um, into our model. And it means that that demand will need to be serviced and it will need to be done on a modern platform. Otherwise people won't meet the outcomes the government expects. 
Great. And, and from a global perspective, you, you know, you look at the map there, you're predominantly in, in Asia and you talk a lot about Malaysia and Australia. Where, where are you positioned in regards to the other areas in Asia? Yeah. So, you know, I think um, when, when you start a technology company, you always have this temptation to try and tackle the, the whole world, right? You know, anyone can use your product. And we do. We've got users in every country. In fact, we've got um, education providers on the platform from 16 countries. Uh, and the U.S. is actually our third largest market for users. But from a business perspective, we focus on Australia and Malaysia because we know that these two countries have close links from an education perspective. They have a very strong private higher education, uh, higher education markets and the, the regulations are very easy to understand. Um, so we've gone deep in these two markets to try and capture the country. So in Malaysia, we're the largest platform for higher education in the country and that provides a good network effect. Now, where we're going is we're tackling uh, other countries in Southeast Asia. And we already have um, a number of uh, universities on board in Indonesia that are using the platform now. Um, you know, and, but it's just, it's just a start. Um, and we see that as you know, early stages, doing the groundwork. Um, for the US, Canada, UK, uh, these are markets which are much more uh, developed and advanced. So you know, we see institutions from those countries uh, coming on using our self-service product and delivering courses um, to you know, their, their own students. Uh, so that's how we've attracted students and providers in those countries to a self-service model. Uh, other countries in Southeast Asia require a lot more work because we really have to understand the local market uh, to, to grow there. Um, and one last question here, Adam, which is based to, obviously around the COVID theme. Um, have you seen an increase in demand, uh, an increase in contracts and, and partnerships as a result of this? And is this a you know, has this opened up something uh, moving forward in, in regards to the online trend? Yeah, it definitely has. Um, and it's, it's quite a complex situation, a very unfortunate situation, but a very complex situation as well. Um, in that, you know, on our software as a service model, for example, institutions keep most of the economics from those courses they deliver. You know, we, we get a small fee for every user on the platform uh, from those institutions and they keep the majority. And that, that's how they would normally, uh, you know, like it to be. But as a lot of these institutions come under financial pressure, they can't actually invest in the online education that they need for their students to keep the business going or to enter new markets. Now, while that, is a, that, that can be a challenge, um, we've still seen a huge increase in, in the number of inquiries and the number of partnerships we're doing. It also presents an opportunity where we can actually take uh, a share of revenue going forward, uh, which results in a much higher fee for every student on the platform uh, in, in some of the recent ones, you know, it's up to 10 times higher than we would get on a SaaS model um, because they can't afford to fund the upfront costs. So we, we give them more flexible terms in the near term and in the medium term uh, will benefit significantly uh, from that. So we are seeing those kinds of dynamics happening. Um, that said, that the demand has been significant on both the platform, uh, the learning services. So you've probably seen we've signed up a few more universities uh, recently as well. Uh, ACU, Deakin, uh, Harriet Watt in, in Malaysia. Uh, plus a lot of other smaller providers. So definitely demand is there, uh, it's growing. Um, and just one thing I'd add is that, you know, previously I'd spend, you know, a few years talking to a university and they plan six months in advance, three months in advance. You know, you, you, can, you, you end up talking to everybody and you're not sure where you're getting to sometimes. But after COVID, it's been compressed. You know, now things are done in weeks or months instead of months and years. Um, and, you know, previously when you have to wait for, you know, a board sign off on something, it would take a long time. Now they say, oh, we're convening the board in two weeks time, we'll put it there. Um, so I think the style of doing business has changed uh, in the higher education sector. Um, and, you know, I, I couldn't be happier about that. Okay, Adam, uh, that's all we have time for. Thanks again for your time and um, congratulations on uh, growing the business so, so well uh, for the last decade or so. Thank you, Tim. All the best, everyone. Cheers. Thank you. Um, next up, we have ResApp, um, ASX code RAP, market cap of around 100 million. We have with us the CEO, Tony Keating. Uh, we've already had lots of questions coming through for Tony. Uh, the company's had a one year return of uh, 16%. What does the company do? It develops digital healthcare solutions to assist doctors and allow patients to diagnose and manage respiratory disease. Tony, thank you for your time um, and over to you. Great, thanks Tim. Uh, thanks everybody for joining. And I guess I should also thank Share Cafe for the opportunity to present here today. 
Um, obviously, we're all under some restrictions with COVID-19. So it's really great that we're able to still share our story uh, with both potential new investors and provide some update uh, to our existing shareholders. So if we just go to the next slide, please. It's the standard disclaimer. So at ResApp, as a team, what we're doing is we're building regulatory approved and clinically validated respiratory disease diagnostic tools that only require a smartphone. Uh, and we're at a stage now um, over the last few months where we've now launched two exciting products uh, into the market. So ResApp DX is the world's first and only smartphone based diagnostic test. And we're heavily focused on bringing that into telehealth. And we've recently launched that product now onto two telehealth platforms in Australia. Sleep Check is again the first and only direct to consumer sleep apnea screening app, uh, which we launched on the App Store last month. Uh, so these two products really changed the game for ResApp, put us into revenue generating mode, put us into sales mode uh, as we push those products forward. Beyond that, we do have a pipeline of products um, in asthma management, COPD management, consumer health, wearable devices, all really based on the fact that we are the world's leader in analyzing audio for respiratory disease. So next slide, please. So respiratory disease is the most, out, most common outcome from you going and visiting a doctor. Uh, we are estimating that there's over 700 million doctor visits every year that result in a diagnosis of respiratory disease. This could be something as simple as the common cold and upper respiratory tract infection, uh, or more seriously, uh, lower respiratory tract disease like asthma, pneumonia, bronchiolitis. Uh, it's these lower respiratory tract diseases where our real focus is. Our real focus is identifying these lower respiratory tract diseases so they can be treated uh, and patients can get better faster. Uh, so just next, please. So today, that diagnosis uh, is done using a bunch of different tools using a stethoscope, using chest X-ray, spirometry, blood tests, sputum tests, basically a whole suite of tools that the clinician uses to come up with what is a subjective diagnosis. What we found in our clinical studies is that this subjective diagnosis actually tends to be relatively inaccurate as well. Uh, so we've seen up to 30% disagreement between clinicians when they're trying to make this diagnosis. Uh, so our tool helps reduce that subjectivity it's obviously based on a smartphone, so it reduces those costs. Um, and it's also instantaneous, so it, is, it reduces that time. The next slide, please. So this is ResApp DX. ResApp DX is our flagship product, our first product that's entered the market. It uses machine learn, learning technology that looks for signatures in cough sounds to make a diagnosis of respiratory disease. The key value proposition that ResApp brings, ResApp DX brings, is that it uses the built-in microphone to do that cough recording and then does the analysis on device. Uh, so this means we can deploy in an in-person setting using an off-the-shelf smartphone, or we can do a remote test uh, in something like a telehealth setting. Uh, ResApp DX is CE marked and TGA approved as a class 2A medical device. So it provides an aid to a diagnosis to a clinician. And ResApp is underpinned by really a growing patent portfolio. We have uh, a number of patents, seven uh, patent applications, that are looking at different ways of using that audio signal to form this diagnosis. Uh, so the, the technology itself is very simple to use. Simply hold the phone about an arm's length away from the patient. Uh, next slide, please. Patient coughs five times. We record those coughs. Next, next slide, please. Enter some details about the patient. Next slide, please. Some details about the history of the illness. Next slide and then for, provide an instantaneous diagnosis report. So on the next slide, we talk about the validation. So we've been, over the last five years since ResApp was founded, we've been heavily focused on validating the performance of this technology in clinical studies. So these are double blind prospective clinical studies, the gold standard of clinical studies for medical devices. We've gotten excellent results both here in Australia and in the United States. And we've published those results in peer reviewed, reviewed journals and presented at leading medical device or medical conferences. Next slide, please. As we talked about, uh, as I talked about initially, one of the target markets for us is in telehealth. Uh, telehealth is when you are visiting a doctor or seeing your doctor over a video consultation. Uh, it's a large addressable market, and this is one of the key reasons why it's the fastest growing area of healthcare. Uh, so that large addressable market coupled with very high consumer demand coupled with a very low cost of care, 
coupled with payers willing to pay for telehealth, all of these things have come together to really grow telehealth um, in a fast way. And you, as you'll see on the next slide, the, it's grown even faster once COVID-19 has occurred. And so these are numbers that have come out over the last few months with COVID-19. So as you can see, the US, we're now talking about a billion possible virtual visits predicted for this year. Providers in the US have seen 50 to 175 times the number of telehealth visits this year than they saw last year. In China, a company like Ping An saw 1.1 billion visitors to their platform in just a few weeks in January. Um, and this is on top of you know, the normal standard sort of Ping An um, 266 million consultations pre-COVID that they saw last year. In both Great Britain and Australia, what you're seeing is a huge number of GP visits being moved online. So in Great Britain at the moment, the, according to the Royal College of General Practitioners, 71% of all GP visits in April were done remotely. In Australia, we're up to 35%. So out of the, the Medicare item reports that you can get, 35% of all GP visits in Australia were done remotely uh, during the month of May. So this is a massive shift. From Australia, we've gone from 0.1% of GP visits to 35% in just a few months. The next slide. So what ResAppDx does here, it enables telehealth within by providing a remote diagnosis service. So what we've found over the years is that up to half of all telehealth visits are for respiratory disease. And today, the issue is that you, as a doctor, you can't use a stethoscope. So you don't have that first um, diagnosis tool. You don't really have any diagnosis tools available to you in that telehealth session. So we're able to integrate ResAppDx into a telehealth provider's software platform to provide a software-only diagnostic test. And what you see here on the right is actually our test integrated into CoView's platform. And so over the last month, we've now launched this telehealth integration in both Phoenix Health and CoView here in Australia. Our business model is that we get paid per test. So every time our test is used, we receive a fee. That fee is within our targeted range of five to $10 per test. The actual fee is not disclosed at this point. Next slide, please. So telehealth is that first target market where we see a very strong value proposition. And as, as I said, we're now available on two telehealth platforms in Australia. In the clinic, we have approvals for health economic evaluations, both in the UK and Europe. In the developing world, we have partnerships with Alara Health based in Kenya to demonstrate and evaluate the technology in the developing world. And in the direct con to consumer space, we have a partnership with RB, one of the largest global uh, consumer health product manufacturers. Next slide, please. So the other product that we're talking about is sleep apnea and sleep check. So sleep check is the most, or sleep apnea is the most common sleep breathing disorder. And what we found is roughly one in five Australians have sleep apnea, but approximately 80% of those people with sleep apnea don't know that they have it. So this is and not just snoring. This is actually a serious health condition. It's linked to increased risk of heart disease, stroke, type two diabetes. And today to be diagnosed with sleep apnea basically requires you to be wired up with 12 cables, have a sleep in an unfamiliar environment, and then have a, a sleep doctor re review those results uh, and come up with a diagnosis. So on the next slide. So in, at, at the end of last month, we launched Sleep Check on the App Store. Sleep Check is a direct-to-consumer, no doctor referral required, just a simple download screening tool for sleep apnea that allows consumers to very accurately estimate or measure their risk of sleep apnea. It's validated in a large clinical study. It's CE marked and TGA approved as a medical device. And of course, it doesn't require any wires, cuffs or attacks. It's just a smartphone placed on the bedside table. It's available now on the App Store in both Australia and the UK, and it'll be coming soon in additional countries and on Android. So on the next slide, please. So in summary, there's really uh, three aspects to ResApp's business. So the first is ResApp DX. So ResApp DX is our clinical use acute respiratory disease diagnostic test. It's available now, generating revenue on multiple telehealth platforms here in Australia. The focus this, this quarter is for us to expand availability in Australia and also partnering in the UK and Europe, where we also have CE mark approval, so we're able to enter those markets. Sleep Check is our direct-to-consumer sleep apnea screening app, as I said, available now on the App Store People are downloading it, people are purchasing this product today. Uh, and we are launching a large marketing campaign in the first week of August 
uh, to really drive usage of sleep check here in Australia and in the UK. Uh, and then finally, there's an industry leading pipeline leveraging that ability to use sound for respiratory disease diagnosis, screening and management. And we have a number of products in that pipeline that are, you know, I guess generating opportunities, both near term, mid term, but also long term. So thanks, Tim. Happy to open the floor to some questions. Yeah, thanks, Tony. Um, incredible technology um, and, and good timing, I suppose. Can, can you tell us a little bit about the, the revenue model for uh, ResApp DX, um, 5 to $10? Is that the, the person using the phone using that or is that part of the diagnostic test at the end? Uh, so the 5 to $10 is what we receive, what ResApp receives. Um, so that's how we've always positioned it. I think it's, it's up to our customers, our partners, about how they charge that on to the patients. Um, so I think, you know, Coview and Phoenix are both charging a little over $10 uh, per test. Uh, and then there's obviously um, some fees associated with it before it comes to us. So, you know, Coview and Phoenix have, uh, I guess, payment fees before they come to us. But what comes to us, what you'll see in our revenue line is that 5 to $10 per test. And is this a product that, you know, talk about the states that needs FDA approval? Yes, yeah. So we've uh, been engaged with the FDA with some time. Um, we're currently um, talking to a number of different uh, consultants in the US around uh, reapproaching the FDA uh, and bringing the, the product back into the US. So uh, I guess the, the US is um, a part of our focus, uh, but our primary focus is, you know, we have marketing approval in Australia and Europe. Uh, and so we're really keen to, to demonstrate that we can bring that product into the market and generate real revenue in those countries. And in and, and Asia, where does that sit in the, the revenue model? Uh, so depending on the product, uh, so sleep check is, is something that we're keen to start launching into Asia relatively quickly. Um, you know, the, our regulatory approvals allow that. Um, so you should see as well as entering other European countries, we'll be looking at other Asian countries. Uh, ResApp DX, again, is really around those telehealth partners uh, and being able to work with telehealth partners to, to deploy it into those countries. So we are discussing with a number of telehealth uh, companies in Asia. Uh, it's a matter of getting the, the right time with the right partner um, and the right opportunity uh, to go after. And the sleep check um, revenue model is a subscription service or something like that? No, so the, the, the sleep check model is a simple pay to download the test. Uh, so very straightforward, um, direct, direct purchase of a product. Uh, in the long term, there are additional revenue opportunities, obviously, on the back end of that product. You have someone now who has essentially been um, screened at, of having high risk of sleep apnea. So there are obviously opportunities to pass those to different partners, whether they be sleep apnea therapy companies, whether they be sleep testing companies, uh, whether they be you know, different, different parts of the sleep apnea ecosystem. Um, and so there are obviously additional partnership and additional revenue opportunities for us down the line. But right now it's, it's you know, pay to purchase the product. Sure. And, and one last question around, like, what, what is the process for an Australian company to connect to an international, um, you know, telepartner? Tele yeah, partner. So, so we have a director of sales and marketing that we hired a few months ago based in the UK. Um, Jamie has been on board now for, for a few months, has done some great work um, getting in the door with most of the European telehealth companies. Uh, and we have a number of those telehealth companies looking under the hood right now. Um, obviously our launch in Australia is going to uh, push that level of, of interest further. Um, and you know, we've now demonstrated that we can deploy effectively on two, two very different telehealth platforms here in Australia, which really shows that you know, our systems are in place to, to now deploy uh, into additional telehealth services globally. Great. Um, thanks for your time, Tony. Um, sounds like an incredible opportunity for an Australian company. Um, so that is all we have had time for today. Thank you again. Uh, we have a webinar again next week and uh, we'll see you then. Thank you.